G'day everyone! Today we're going to be taking a look at one of my favourite computers here, the Spark Station 20. It's one of the first computers I actually bought for my collection. I bought it about 12 years ago for less than 100 Australian dollars. And I bought it mostly because it's one of the kinds of computers I used to use back when I was at university. Although I used to use these through something called an X-Terminal. Today we're going to take a quick look at the history of the machine, although there's not very much of that. Uh, we'll take a look inside and we'll play with some software. Sun originated from Stanford University in the early 1980s, founded by graduate students. The name Sun seems to come from a pun on the university's computer network, which was known as SunNet. The first Sun computer actually came before the company, and was a personal CAD workstation designed using the Motorola 68000 and spare parts from the computer science department and Silicon Valley supply houses. This design would be the basis for the Sun 1, which was the first official workstation to carry an early version of the Sun logo. Through these early Motorola 68K workstations, Sun would become well known for making Unix computers with high quality graphics. They would replace the Motorola processors with one of their own design in 1987. The Spark architecture was strongly influenced by the experimental Berkeley RISC system and would outperform most of the competition. This led to virtually every Unix vendor hurrying to make a RISC design of their own. Digital would come out with the Alpha, HP would make the PA RISC, and SGI bought MIPS computer systems as sort of a shortcut. These Spark-based machines would come in a variety of form factors, from smaller workstations in these cute little lunchbox cases, to the larger pizza box workstations with greater capacity, to the even larger sized enterprise servers which had large amounts of memory and processing power. As I mentioned before, my machine is a Spark Station 20. It was released in 1994 and is one of the more capable of the 32-bit Spark machines. It could take up to 512 megabytes of system memory and could support up to four processors. Because of its capability, these machines were often deployed as servers due to their cost per performance, often being used as web servers. One notable use of this model was its involvement in making the movie Toy Story. The animators were using high-end SGI workstations that were extremely expensive, but also extremely good at 3D graphics. It would have been too expensive to build a render farm out of such machines, so after benchmarking and testing, they settled on using the Spark Station 20 as it combined multiple CPUs in a small enough package with lower cost and decent performance. They ended up using 117 machines, 87 with two 100 MHz ROS HyperSparks, and 30 with four 100 MHz ROS HyperSparks. These were coordinated by a single larger 8 CPU Spark server to provide data and manage the cluster. Over the life of this model, there were a number of different CPU modules you could install starting as low as 50 MHz, but reaching as high as 200 MHz. There were two slightly different core designs that were the most used, SuperSpark and HyperSpark. The SuperSpark was made by Texas Instruments for Sun, and these modules generally featured a large cache. The HyperSpark was made by Ross Technology and generally achieved higher clock rates, but with a smaller cache and worse memory latency. In general, it very much depends on the workload to determine which implementation performs faster. I wrote a comparison on my blog some time ago, which I'll link in the description below. Inside my machine, I have three CPUs, two 50 MHz SuperSparks on a dual card and a 60 MHz SuperSpark on a separate module. I have a 90 MHz ROS HyperSpark as a spare module which by itself isn't faster than the three I have installed. I have 272 megabytes of RAM installed and 18 gigabytes of hard disk space 
on a single SCA hard disk. I cannot use the onboard CG14 frame buffer because I don't have a vSIM, but I do have an SBUS Turbo GX 2MB frame buffer card to allow me to run the machine as a workstation. If you ever get a similar age sun machine, you'll find it helpful to have a straight through serial cable. I have two adapters and some Cat5 cable. This is useful for some of the more modern sun machines I have. The reason you want a serial cable is to interact with the machine's console, where you'll see some diagnostic messages during the boot up process, which can take some time depending on the PROM settings. It's feasible to install an operating system and use the machine via the serial terminal if you don't have enough hardware for an interactive display. For such a display, you'll need a keyboard, mouse and frame buffer and a means to connect it to a display. My frame buffer has a 13W3 connector, so I bought an adapter to connect to VGA screens. Not all screens will work with the output from typical frame buffers, but I've had no problems with the displays I've tried. The machine ROM will not turn on the display unless there is a keyboard connected. It needs a special Sun keyboard and mouse, which can be difficult to acquire. I was lucky enough to be gifted some by a work colleague. Once you're powered on, you will probably need to use the Open Boot ROM to configure and boot the system. There is some basic online help in the ROM and some commands to boot the system or power it off, but something you might not expect is that it also contains a fourth interpreter. My machine is already configured and has an operating system installed so I just boot the local hard disk. I chose NetBSD to install on this machine, as it is one of the few modern operating systems to still support 32-bit Spark. Back in the day, you'd usually find either SunOS or Solaris installed, but there were a few other options, such as NextStep. I'm using FVWM as my window manager, partly as it's what I used on the X terms back in the day and is a nostalgic favourite for me now. I've compiled some X Windows games. Here's some of them being played using my computer as the X server. I'm considering making a video series to show some of these in more detail. Let me know in the comments if that would interest you. I was also able to compile to web browsers, Lynx and Dillo. They can both view modern websites, although without JavaScript. The performance is a bit slow, 
but it is surprisingly usable given the system. Although stuff like Twitter doesn't work because of the lack of JavaScript. DOSBox of all things compiles and works. The display doesn't update particularly fast, partly due to the limited 10 megabit networking. I also imagined that the machine's relatively low performance would be a factor. Not sure if these benchmark values are correct. I apologize for the flicker, but I couldn't run these games on an X server I could capture. These games don't work on 24 bit color displays. XDoom, for instance, requires an 8-bit display. Here it is running at double the normal 320 by 200 size. It runs quite well, all things considered. Here it is running at the standard 320 by 200. It's too small for playability, but it does render reasonably fast. I believe this version of Doom and the X server can't change the frame buffer's resolution, so we're kind of stuck with a small window. The X11 version of Maelstrom is similar in that it requires an 8-bit display, but it's quite playable as the window is large enough, although the text is a little small. Unfortunately, at this point, the power supply in my machine appeared to die. I've ordered a replacement, and I might have a go at refurbishing this one. The board looks a bit greasy and dirty, suggesting to me that the capacitors have let go. There might be more wrong with it, but I can't exactly make it more broken. This is kind of sad for me, as this is one of my favourite computers. It taught me much of what I know about Sun hardware, and the basics of getting one of these going. I used it for a time as a server, providing a basic website and subversion repositories for some of my projects. Even the name I use for my channel and other media came from it, being a play on the name Spark. I eventually retired it from its role as a server when I got hardware to allow for a display. Since then I use it as a vintage workstation, mostly for fun. Given I can't show any more of my machine running, I'm going to have to leave it here for today. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.